Hi everyone, my name is Dr. Scott Schell and I'm a specialist in the Germanic languages. I have a bachelor's degree in German, a master's degree in linguistics, and a PhD in Germanic linguistics. Um, in this second part of the video series concerning the horns of Gallius, what I wanted to do was go ahead and focus on the function of the horns and the icons in question. Uh, if you have not seen part one of this video series, please go ahead and see that uh, first. Um, it is there where I actually give an argument for the translation concerning ek klewagastis holtians horna tawido, in which case I argued meant um, I, the fame guest, i.e. the one who has received lofty hospitality from Holt or Holstein, gifted these two horns. So now that I have, you know, argued for a translation concerning the runes, I wanted to talk about the other functions um, and images behind these two horns. Uh, the first thing, however, that I want to go ahead and clear up is that in the first video I said I was going to be using the two sketches um, and the these two sketches I accidentally credited to Ola Worm. Ola Worm was actually the the one who did uh, create the very first sketch of DR12A um, however it was actually uh, Pauly that created both of the sketches that I'm going to refer to in this video so I just wanted to clear that up real quick um, so all right well now, uh, you know, I guess we could just go ahead and discuss the, the overall function, if you will, of the horn. So what we're actually dealing with is uh, mythic cattle raiding. We're dealing with uh, various motifs uh, concerning uh, a figure which offers, uh, which is offering like a ritual drink. We're dealing with star ornaments. We're dealing with like what's called a push me pull you horse. Um, we are dealing with arguably a theriomorphic representation of Thor and human beings shaped into uh, runes. Uh, we're also dealing possibly with a heroic mythic figure uh, by the name of Trito, in which case is a, uh, which, which actually is actually represented in the Indo-European myths. So let's go ahead and look at each section and I'll go ahead and break it down as much as I can for you. All right, so the first figure that I want to talk about is the centaur. This is actually of Mediterranean influence. This doesn't really come from an Indo-European tradition. Uh, and the reason I say that is because of the, the centaur, meaning, you know, half horse, half human, uh, comes from the Mediterranean regions. There are no Scandinavian folktales um, or German folktales, for example, to my knowledge, um, which have tales about centaurs. Uh, it shouldn't really come to a it shouldn't really be a surprise rather to anyone um, because of course we have Mediterranean influence to this day you know in in our our folk tales for example uh, the mermaid uh, the mermaid was actually uh, it literally means like sea maid or sea woman or it really is sea unmarried woman if you will and uh, originally the notion of the mermaid was just like this ghostly figure of a like a ruler of the sea and in fact in Swedish you see that word sjora in which case um, it had nothing to do with the half fish half woman aspect that we understand as the mermaid today that's actually uh, Greek influence from the siren so in this case uh, with the centaur I have no problem really just claiming that it's really just Mediterranean influence that we see here regarding this particular image. All right so you may have also noticed the star ornaments on the horns uh, as well. There are uh, these, these particular star ornaments can be found all kind on all kinds of different uh, artifacts in the Germanic and Scandinavian uh, regions as I've shown you here um, with all these different variations of these these stars. However, um, at least one particular star here on the, one particular star style, if you will, on the Horn of Gallius can actually be seen on several other um, Germanic or Scandinavian artifacts as well. So, for example, you see it on a sword bridge mount from a weapon in Thorsburg, Germany. You can see that the, the star ornament on this uh, bridge mount is the same star ornament that you find in the Horn of Gallius. Um, you can actually see this, star, this same star ornament on a fibula uh, which was located outside of Zeeland, Denmark, and you can see the same star ornament found on a buckle just outside of Belgium. So we don't really know what the function behind these stars, you know, were. Um, 
However, uh, it is safe to say that this is a Germanic use of it, or a Scandinavian use of it, probably a wider Germanic use of it, of course, uh, since you know you find it, you know this this usage in Belgium, um, and among other you know areas as well. Um, there is a scholar by the name of Hartner who wrote an article in 1969 who claims that these stars claim, um, or, or, or is rather, are supposed to represent uh, some sort of uh, solar eclipse which happened in April of the year 413. However, I don't, uh, I don't really see how that can represent some sort of eclipse, especially when you look at the images as as a whole really in the context of these two horns in which case hopefully will become clear to you throughout this video um, the reference to a solar eclipse just doesn't really make a ton of sense to me all right so the next section i would like to go ahead and talk about is a possible theriomorphic representation of four um, this can be found at the bottom of horn a that is dr12a um, and it seems that there is a, a goat here which is uh, in the middle of these these two uh, these two cattle, right? So, um, what I mean by theriomorphic is that it is literally the god which embodies the animal, and um, the the cattle could actually be representations of like an earlier reflex of the tale that we find in the Prosetta concerning uh, Thor and his two goats, uh, Tan Grisner and uh, Tan Nyoster, uh, which respectively mean like teeth snarler and teeth grinder, and um, so before you, you know, you might question, well, that, that's quite a jump, right? To say like, oh, there's a theriomorphic representation, meaning that Thor is embodying this goat. Um, I recently wrote a review on Lieberman's 2016 book, in which case he argues uh, that the earliest representation of, representations of Odin and Freyr are actually representations really, well, well, more or less to where the gods embody the horse. Uh, in, in, in Odin, for example, concerning the, the horse in the wild hunt, and uh, the horse Freyfoxy in Hrafnkel Saga uh, may have actually been Freyr embodying this horse rather than the, the horse belonging to Freyr. That actually does make a ton of sense uh, linguistically. If you look at the word Yggdrasil, for instance, it does not say Igger's horse or Odin's horse. That would actually be Yggdrasil. In which case, uh, we don't have that. We have Yggdrasil, right? We have literally terror horse. And the same thing can be said for Freyfoxy as well. Uh, in which case, if it was actually a horse belonging to Freyr, it would be Freysfoxy. But instead, we are literally given uh, Freyfoxy, in which case means Frey horse or Freyr horse, right? Uh, so just kind of an idea there that this may be some sort of theriomorphic representation of Thor. Um, it may or may not be correct. I mean, it's just something that does make sense within the context of, of these things overall. All right, the next thing I wanted to talk about is this very peculiar three-headed figure. Um, Krause, uh, among other, you know, runologists and linguists believe that this, uh, this figure may have been like a three-headed god and is even reflected on the Gundestrup uh, cauldron, which is of Celtic origin. Um, however, Bruce Lincoln has argued that this is not actually a god, but it is a, a representation of a, a mythic hero, which can also be a three-headed mythic hero, or at least a hero with the name literally three, uh, rooted in Indo-European tradition. So it's been suggested by Lincoln here that uh, this, this character, Trito, is a, again, like I said, this sort of mythic hero, in which case he finds parallels in the Indo-Iranian tradition, uh, to which he also demonstrates that you can find this, uh, this character in the Indian uh, Rigveda, in which case he is, he is known as Trita. Uh, however, in the Avestan tradition, he is known as Trita, in which case he argues that um, there is the, this relationship between the mythic warrior Trita and the mythic god Indra to where they, they share this sort of relationship to where you have the mythic hero who appeals to the mythic god and uh, they basically help each other out in this, this sense of cattle raiding and of uh, like in the sense of, of like serpent slaying. So I'm going to go ahead and read you two passages here uh, by Bruce Lincoln to hopefully you know, have this make a little bit more sense as to what we're, we're dealing with here. So he writes, uh, In the Rig Veda, cited above, Trita is said to be impelled by Indra. And similarly, he is aided by the god in the Rig Veda. 
Uh, Krita, in turn, gives Soma, like an alcoholic beverage, to Indra, and is said to drink the intoxicating brew alongside him as well in the Rigveda. Their uh, relation is an exchange of strength, the typical relation between the warrior and the warrior god. Uh, given this, it seems that both Trita and Indra were originally present in the Indian version of this myth, Trita appearing as the hero who actually slew the monster, and Indra as the god who aided him in the exploit. Um, Lincoln also provides similar uh, parallels to Trito in the Avestan text concerning uh, Trita and the Greco-Roman tradition. However, it is in the latter tradition where Lincoln informs us that the hero acts alone and needs no help from the divine figure. Uh, this seems to be a common feature of European versions for this myth, uh, for a Germanic version to basically likewise preserve this, uh, this sort of myth within these horns, but have no possible connection to a god, uh, and just sort of relying on one's own might and main might not be really that far out of the question. Um, so in our case of DR-12b, the three serpents lying dead next to this, next to Trito, uh, most likely depict earlier exploits of him defeating the serpents. Uh, so ultimately, Lincoln concedes that the three-headed figure on the Gallius horn is certainly not a perfect reflex of this Indo-European idea, uh, but, it can, uh, but it is certain that this is an independent Germanic reflex of the myth uh, concerning the themes of triplicity, serpentine enemies, and the taking of livestock by force. So essentially, we're dealing with a mythic hero here. Um, and we have, you know, the, the, the serpents that are, that are slayed, and we also, of course, as I had mentioned, uh, taking livestock by force. So there could be some sort of Indo-European, some sort of deep Indo-European uh, tradition here uh, in connection to this, this Trito figure and some of the, uh, the, figures, the other figures that we see on the horn as well. So the next mysterious figure we have is this, this uh, figure with, with horns and a spear and a large ring. Um, it has been suggested by more than one scholar that this is either a representation of Ullr or Odin. Um, however, uh, an article by Brink in 2007 shows us that there are absolutely no place names whatsoever um, dedicated to Ullr, at least in Denmark. Um, they're actually more localized to like uh, Sweden and I believe Eastern Norway. Um, so it's, but but people have made this connection to where it could be Ullr because he is often represented with like a bow and skis. He is a god of a, of a hunt, for example. Uh, but also who else is responsible or at least, sorry, represented uh, in, in the hunt, right? It's Odin, right? He's the leader of the wild hunt. Uh, so we have um, a possible connection here to Odin or a possible connection here to Ullr. Uh, you know, regardless, um, you know, I believe that this is, I personally believe that this is more of a connection to Odin just because of the more pan-Germanic uh, notion behind Odin. Uh, and, you know, Ullr is arguably not test attested in any of the Germanic languages, um, aside from one runic inscription where uh, it may be a reference to Ullr. Um, so either way, we have this figure here. It's more than likely a representation of Ullr or Odin. You know, I'll go ahead and let you be the judge of that and, you know, make your own claims, but I personally lean more towards uh, the representation of, of Odin. So the next icon is the so-called push-me-pull-you horse. I'm not exactly sure what this, uh, this icon represents. Um, it's uh, undoubt undoubtedly in a mythic context, of course, uh, and according to McLeod and Mies uh, in 2006, they said that this two-headed horse also appears um, among the East Alpine votive statues, uh, in which case it's associated with uh, this figure named Reita if that's how you pronounce that correctly. But it's, so it could be rooted in this sort of Indo-European notion. Um, but if anything, it's probably just, again, influence from the Southern regions. So uh, if anybody has any more information regarding the Push Me Pull You Horse, uh, go ahead and comment below. I'd be more than happy to read anything else on that idea. All right, now in this next part, um, what I wanted to talk about is the evidence of uh, runic postures where you know, humans are actually being shaped in runes. 
So for those, uh, those people out there who say that runic stavas never existed, this is a piece of evidence that you could throw at them and say, hey, actually there are human beings here uh, shaped in runic forms. So um, there was an, a scholar that I had mentioned earlier named Hartner. He wrote that 1969 article on the Horns of Gallius. He actually um, argued that these human beings were representations of cryptic runes, and it does seem likely. Uh, if you look at some of them, for example, there are clear cases of like Perithor runes, uh, Gibo runes, and arguably some other runic forms uh, as well. Um, he also offered a translation uh, for the cryptic runes, in which case it read uh, Luba Horns Ains Helpa uh, Hyoho, in which case uh, he gives a translation in German, but ultimately it means like this magical drink within the horn I would like to offer to the Sib. Um, I would love to actually agree with him there uh, on linguistic grounds, but Antonsen in 1975 rightfully said, you know, that uh, the, the linguistic forms just, it's simply impossible. So I, you know, I would hope to one day uh, to be able to revisit this and maybe uh, analyze that further and really kind of crack the code, if you will, and, and try to understand those cryptic runes a little bit better. Um, but one thing's for sure, these are human beings in the shapes of runes. Um, but we still have no idea quite yet as, as far as like what the representations are, at least if it is a particular inscription that was intended. Uh, next, we have a woman that is holding a ritual drink of some sort. Um, given the semiotic hole of this entire inscription, uh, this is clearly in a ritual setting, right? To where she's she's offering drink uh, within the context of the or the mythic raiding context or hunting context, if you will, within this horn. And ca and she kind of actually, in fact, reminds me of like Wilthio in. Um, in Beowulf, where she offers the drink to Hrothgar and, and his people as well. So uh, if anybody's interested in reading up more on that, I recommend uh, Lady in the Mead Cup by Enright. It's a fantastic book and it discusses like social functions of, of uh, the cupbearer, if you will. But um, we also see this, this image on the Huninga picture stone. And we also see the image of this woman on several pendants uh, as well, in which case I'll go ahead and uh, provide you with a couple of those images here. Uh, I found them in, again, in the, uh, the, the Danish Museum of, I believe it was Copenhagen. So the icons overall. Okay, number one, we have uh, these images of mythic cattle raids are mixed with the dragon slaying myth rooted in Indo-European tradition. Number two, the animals shown are animals tied to the myth. This is reinforced by the notion that we see the centaur and the push me pull you horse. Number three, we have the three headed figure shown on DR12B as a Germanic reflex of the heroic uh, mythic figure. Uh, Trito, in which case he was argued to be this heroic myth mythic figure by Bruce Lincoln, of course. Uh, number four, the depiction of the woman offering a vessel um, as a drinking horn might also show us that this horn was used in a ritual setting. Number five, the figure on uh, horn 12, DR-12B may represent Odin in his connection to the Wild Hunt, but of course uh, it may even represent Uller since he is also a representation of, or at least a god associated with the hunt. He's often associated with a bow uh, and skis. Uh, of course, I argued that I believe it's more uh, of a depiction of Odin in the Wild Hunt rather than Uller. Uh, but, uh, you know, one might argue, you know, back and forth. So we have finally number six, in which case uh, on DR12A, there is a possible theriomorphic representation of Thor. So we have Hlewagastes here, uh, who is fame guest and an accomplished poet. Uh, and he is probably also the one who narrated these tales on these horns. All right, so function and immortality. Uh, this is probably one of the functions of the horn anyway, uh, was to ensure immortality. Uh, there were probably a couple other functions regarding this horn as well, uh, concerning like a successful um, cattle raid, of course, or a successful hunt, if you will. So Krause actually argues that um, 
it's impossible to tell if these horns were made for blowing or if they were made for uh, ritual drinking horns. I believe that they were just ritual drinking horns just because the, the attestations of drinking horns far outweigh um, any evidence for, for blowing horns. Um, and also, you know, like I said, given the context of everything that I've already talked about before this particular section in the video, uh, it seems that, you know, we have this idea of a ritual horn uh, being used, where alcohol is also being used, of course, in a sacred context as well. Um, and of course, you know, nowadays we can just run down to the grocery store, get a six pack of something or whatever and drink it. And it's become such this, this, this like sort of profane act, right? There's nothing really ritualized respect, respectively ritualized about that. Um, like, I mean, like as in ritual in this sort of context. And, um, so when you're sort of drinking this liquid from this horn, it is a, it's a sacred thing, right? It's a sacred beverage, whether it's beer or whether it's mead. And, um, so as far as the Indo-European tradition is concerned, uh, when there is beer that's poured into this horn or mead that's poured into this horn, it is a sacred act. And when you ingest that mead, when you ingest that ale, it is also a sacred act, right? You are participating, uh, really you're kind of participating in a myth um, here on, on Midgard, if you will, here on Earth. It's like this sort of lesser version. And so what I wanted to do is um, go ahead and give you two... Um, citations by a, an amazing article uh, by Moynihan in 2012, in which case I uh, can put all of this into perspective for us concerning like mead or soma or some sort of like ritualized alcoholic beverage. Um, so uh, Moynihan tells us that in nearly all cases, the intoxicating beverages of Indo-European Indo antiquity are directly related to the divine world uh, and their consumption plays a prominent role in religious ritual. Uh, he then provides us with parallels to Vedic Soma and Indo-Iranian Halma and Greek and Roman Nectar, in which case Nectar itself means to, to overcome death, right, to become immortal. So he says, many of these intoxicating drinks and preparations are associated with notions of sustenance and even immortality. The underlying sense of terms for divine food and drink, uh, like the classical Ambrosia and the Hindu Amrita, is identical. Both mean not mortal and are fairly transparent Indo-European cognates. The Greek word nectar uh, also seems to have originally meant overcoming death. A similar motif appears in the northern Germanic realm where we are told that the, the high god Odin needs no victuals. Wine to him uh, is both food and drink. Like all divine things, the substances that the gods indulge in are of a higher uh, order. Mortals have at best lesser, or sorry, access to a lesser version. He then says, typically the intoxicating drink of immortality first reaches the gods after being transported or stolen from a precarious place of birds uh, or by a god slash thief in the shape of a bird. Such is the case with Odin, who steals Othreber, or rearer of inspiration, or mead of poetry, from the daughter of a giant. Some of this mead falls to earth in the process, bestowing the gift of creative inspiration on mankind's poets. I agree that in our case, mead, or mjöth, I uh, could be understood in a similar fashion. Our Scandinavian reflex of the meat of poetry is no exception to these concepts of like soma or halma or nectar. It's, it's very similar, right? So Odin is also said to live on wine alone. This can be seen in Grimnismal, uh, and it can also be, uh, you know, seen in, no, it's specifically, excuse me, specifically stanza seven, uh, 19, rather, in Grimnismal, where we find that, um, that passage. And don't forget, too, that Odin even tells us that um, word fame never dies, right? So this notion of, uh, of being immortal. So to that end, our poet here, Thlewagastis, um, who has crafted this horn, uh, who is also a poet and is also, you know, creating it with the intent of it being, you know, used for ritual and uh, behind, also creating it with the understanding at the time of mead being a very sacred beverage. Um, he, you know, 
he's never going to die, right? So this sort of word fame concept. Uh, the fact that I'm sitting here actually still talking about Lewagostes in the year 2021 uh, really supports this notion that word fame truly never does die. All right, so uh, so now I wanted to go ahead and talk about some uh, iconic or indexical magic. So we have evidence, of course, for these these horns being used in a ritual context now. Um, but what is it? What is it that you might even experience when you know in this time period, if you will, when you ingest this this liquid, when you ingest just this sacred liquid, right? This sacred mead. And I wanted to go ahead and provide you with a couple of examples where, you know, when you actually ingest this mead that um it's not just it's not just mead it's 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 sort of embedded it's 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 sort of empowered right with all kinds of different things and so one of the examples i'll go ahead and read to you is actually from sigurd Riefemol, in which case when uh sigurd jumps uh over the fire the ring of fire and uh frees sigurd Rifa from her chain mail she then gets a horn and she offers him a horn full of ale, right? And she says to Sigurd, I give you beer, apple tree of battle, mixed with magical power and mighty glory. It is full of spells and favorable letters, good charms and runes of pleasure. So it's really, you know, this isn't just ale, right? This ale is actually full of good songs. It is full of good galder or good charms or good spells and runes that actually bring happiness. And so this is an instance again of, of these sort of things being associated with this drink as he is ingesting this, this particular drink. All right, in this next example, uh, it is from Gudrun Akhida Onur, in which case is often translated as Gudrun's second pole, or the, the second or, or the, the second lay of Gudrun, if you will. And in this particular passage, it is Grimhild who offers Gudrun a horn full of uh, an, of ale, in which case is infused, if you will, with like a bunch of ill intent, because the idea is to make Gudrun forget that she is actually in love with Sigurd. So here's the passage. Grimhild brought me a cup to drink from, cool and bitter, so I should not remember the strife. That drink was augmented with fateful power, with the cool sea, with sacrificial blood. In the drinking horn were all kinds of runes, cut and red colored. I should not interpret them, oh, excuse me, I could not interpret them. A long heather fish, an uncut corn ear of the Hutting's land, the entrails of beasts. Many bad things were mixed into that beer, the herbs of all the woodland and burnt acorns, the dew of the hearth, the innards from sacrifice, boiled pig's liver, since it blunted the strife. And then they forgot those who drank it, all the prince's death in the hall, three kings came into my presence before she addressed herself to me. So, in my opinion, it is doubtful that the drink actually consisted of pig's liver and, you know, herbs from all of the woodland. Uh, by the same token, colored material runes could not obviously be seen in the beverage. Uh, the point of this passage is metaphoric. The queen somehow cursed the drink itself within the horn. Uh, when Guthrun ingested this drink, she experienced the curse through an indexical and contagious, contagious relationship uh, employed by Grinnell. And so again, the same thing could sort of be said for the, the horns of Galleus as well, uh, concerning a successful raid or a successful hunt. All right, so concerning these apotropaic functions, these contagious functions of magic, if you will, uh, what I wanted to do was go ahead and share something a little iconic with you all. Um, so I was actually in the Museum of Copenhagen not too long ago, a few years ago, and I noticed that they had a series of drinking horns on display. And these, these horns were from like the 14th, 15th centuries. And of course, they were all placed in Christian context. However, uh, what I noticed is that there, was also, there were also inscriptions around the rims of these horns. And in which case, um, the inscriptions around the rims of the horns were uh, quite, quite obviously there for like magical functions. 
Uh, so the first one that I saw was actually, uh, for those of you interested in Old Saxon, it's actually of low German origin, right? So even though this horn was found in the Denmark area, uh, the language is actually of low German. Uh, and it reads, help Gott, help Maria, in which case is obviously a reference to God and to the Virgin Mary. And so to have this uh, ritual drinking horn with this rim that literally says, you know, if I may loosely translate that as like, may God help me and may Mary help me, um, by drinking from that vessel in a, a ritual religious context, you know, you're appealing to this God in this Christian God in this sense to help you. And by ingesting that liquid, by ingesting, um, you know, the wine or whatever, which would be in that horn, that again is an apotropaic effect, right? You're, you're asking from help from the Christian God or from the Virgin Mary. And by getting that help, you are also partaking in ritual by drinking this, this wine from the horn. So uh, another example is another horn. Uh, which uh, was simply uh, help Maria my so like my Maria help me or again it's another uh, uh, it's another call to the Virgin Mary so my whole point here in showing you these examples though is that even though they are Christian contexts of course this is rooted in a Germanic tradition where you have these inscriptions around the the rim right and you're drinking from these vessels in a ritual religious context and by drinking this liquid you are participating in those sort of magical contexts if you will or those religious contexts and gaining help from these deities all right so here's the big question and i remember when i wrote on this in my uh, my dissertation they said well scott are the runes any different than the roman alphabet most scholars you ask that question, pose that question to, will say no, there's no difference because you'll see that there are uh, instances where magic is being used with the Roman system or the Roman Latin system, um, and then there are, ma there are magical instances of where the runes are being used. However, um, I, I think that it's completely, I, I don't really like that analogy to tell you the truth. Like the, the runes were used in different contexts than the Roman system. And the reason why I say they were used in different systems and different contexts, rather, is because, for example, the runes are in a mythic context, right? So when you are, you know, creating something like the Horn of Gallius, you're, you're having this poet, in which case, uh, is narrating all of these things, but he's also writing in runes, in which case he's very aware that the runes that he's, that he's writing in are all that derive from the ruling gods. Um, or if you want to cite Havamal, they come from Odin himself. And so in our case, uh, I would say that no, the runes are not the exact equivalent of just an alphabet. Well, for one, alphabet literally means alpha beta, right? So in which case with the runes, we're dealing with the Futhark. Um, but either way, you know, it's like they are not used in the same exact context because with the runes, you're dealing with a mythic context. So when the Romans brought the Latin system, it was completely devoid of a mythic context, right? There actually is evidence of uh, the Romans having their own mythic origins of their alphabet uh, via the Greeks, but by the time that the Romans gave that system to the Germanic peoples, uh, their mythic system was completely gone because they were already Christian, right? So I just wanted to touch on that real quick, um, in which case they're not the exact same thing. Uh, the, you, you know, you're actually dealing with runes, in which case uh, you're dealing with a complex uh, mythic system uh, involved here on the Horns of Galleys. So they're not exactly the same thing. All right, so the last thing I wanted to talk about is the mobility of the horns. Krause in 1966 uh, informs us that there were actually two grommets on, that would be dr 12 a, in which case indicates that this horn was actually uh, worn, right? So the reason I'm sort of bringing this up is because the question might might come up, you know, was this horn something that was permanently left in some sort of like sacred place, like a vey or a stall or something like that? Or was it actually um, something that was, that, that moved around with the tribe? And of course it was something that did uh, move around with the tribe. 
so this actually makes a whole lot of sense um, to me anyway since I've argued throughout that what you're dealing with with these particular images and you know the, the runes and everything what you're dealing with is this idea of possibly getting some sort of successful raid um, or a successful hunt if you will from drinking these horns so again I sort of analogize it to other horns that I had found uh, in Copenhagen and of course I analogized it to other uh, ritual and magical contexts that I uh, you know can be found throughout the rest of this video. So I believe, you know, consuming the beverage in a ritual setting before a raid or a hunt could maybe contribute to the success, successful uh, act before it's being ca carried out, if you will. So um, to, to sum up, uh, I suggested first uh, in the, the video before this, that the word horn actually meant two horns, as in Tlewagastis uh, gifted both horns, and so by the employment of the archaic alliterative formula in the Ek Tlebagastis Holthias Horna Tawido, um, it is sort of implying that this poet is making himself uh, eternal. He is gaining immortality. He is gaining fame. And, you know, as, as I had mentioned before, I'm still talking about him to this day, so I guess he was, he's pretty successful in that regard. Um, so the employment of this phonetic iconic formula, basically just the alliteration, uh, it's very much sort of connected to the images themselves uh, through the use of icons. The poet was able to tell us a mythological story, a uh, function not unfamiliar, of course, to poets at the time. Uh, the story most likely involved depicting a successful raid or hunt, with many of its motifs rooted in the Indo-European tradition. Um, and so that's pretty much all I can tell you about these two horns. So you have, that's exactly why in the, in the first video I said you had this sort of nexus of um, lofty hospitality and, and fame um, and, and immortality all being mixed within this, this one big supra object. And, uh, you know, that's what I wanted to give you, at least with the horns of Gallius. Um, that's why, I, you know, I had mentioned earlier in my first video just simply saying I, you know, Thlewagastis made the horn, which is the common translation, is not very adequate. And um, I am not a huge fan of what's really called phonetic isolationism, in which case you have runologists that will just zero in and give you a translation of what the inscription says and not try at least to look at the the context as a whole which i refer to often as the semiotic whole so that is all i have for you all today regarding these two horns all right well i hope you all enjoyed this long and arguably complicated or at least hopefully not too long-winded video um it's been a challenging day to record this video on, and I enjoy doing it, of course, trying to give this information to everyone out there on YouTube. But today in particular, it's, it was very challenging. I counted, you know, joking here with you all, but I'm actually sort of being serious. I counted about seven fire trucks <laughs> that decided to, uh, to go off in the distance and, you know, hopefully everyone's all right. But yeah, I dealt with seven fire trucks, about, about six or seven planes flying overhead. Um, it's just funny because sometimes I could come out to this exact spot where I'm at and uh, it would be completely quiet and, and you know I come out here and do a video and then chaos just kind of breaks loose so anyway I uh, again I hope you all enjoyed it and I hope it wasn't too noisy and um, you know please 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 subscribe so that way I can see you know who's actually interested and who's following me and leave a comment below Follow me on Instagram, too. I'm still doing the whole old Saxon word of the day thing. So, all right. Well, I'm wishing you all a pleasant week, and I'll see you soon.